Hi, everybody. Um, so we are still talking about limits, and we're going to uh, introduce a neat little trick here uh, for computing a limit. This is something called the squeeze theorem, um, and we'll need to use this to do some important uh, limits later on. Um, so I'll try to illustrate it first before I state it. I've got a, a little sketch here of three graphs, three functions and their graphs. H of X is the blue one on top. G of X is in black in the middle and F of X is below them in red. And the idea for this theorem is that if we're interested in the limit of the function g as we approach some point, in this case it's going to be as x goes towards this value a, g itself might be a tricky function to find the limit of, but perhaps there are two functions that bound it, right? One's always above and one's always below, and if those two functions go to a limit at this point a as they do in this picture, notice I've drawn in uh, one point here. Um, I'm going to say they all go through it, though we don't know that they're defined there or not, but their graphs all get closer and closer to it. If we know G is pinned between those two and those two squeeze in together there, it must also go there, right? And the intuition is really just this picture. So let me state uh, the theorem and then we'll do an example. And that's all we'll do with this one. I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, if the functions F, G, and H are all defined near A. So remember, near just means on some open interval. It could be near's, near's a little bit um, imprecise, maybe. Um, it just means any open interval, and any open interval could be could be large, it could be it could be small, um, but as long as there's any open interval um, that these functions are defined on, um, except possibly at a. Right again, we don't care with limits about this particular value. Um, so they're defined on, on an interval near A, so it contains A, maybe not defined there. Um, and we know that F of X uh, is less than or equal to G of X, which is less than or equal to A of X, H of X um, on this interval. Um, near A. Um, again, except possibly at A, and I'll say more about that in just a second. So we've got three functions defined near a point, except possibly at that point. And we know that near that point, there's an order of, of uh, the, the size of the values. One is on the, always on the bottom, one's always on the middle, and one's always on top. So if we've got those three with, with equality, they could be tied in bottom or top. Um, if we, we've got all these things and the limit as x goes to a of f of x is equal to li the limit as x goes to a of h of x, which is equal to some value l. So they both have limits, meaning both limits are, uh, exist and the limits are the same thing, right? Then we know the limit as x goes to a of g of x is also equal to l. And again, it's this picture, the statement that both the top and bottom function, F and H in this construction, have a limit and it's equal is, is how we write down mathematically what I've got in this picture, that they're squeezing together to a point, right? Because they're both approaching the value L from, from both directions, those limits exist. And then because we know G's stuck in between them, it has no choice but to go towards that point as well, right? If they're getting closer and closer to a point, and G is between them, it has to be getting closer and closer to that same point. 
Um, the ordering doesn't really matter at that point, right? It could be the case that all three of these functions have a whole at x equals a, and maybe g is defined to be the largest, f is defined to be in the middle, and h is defined to be below them. That's fine though, those three values, right? Uh, these jumps don't change what's happening. Remember the limit cares about the points around a. And so the fact that these functions might be defined to be something strange at a doesn't change what's happening uh, with the limit. Okay, so that's our squeeze theorem. Let's do an example. Let's look at this function. Let's look at the function. Um, let's call it k of x. And this is going to be x squared times the cosine two pi over x. So this is an interesting function. We don't, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to know what this thing does, right? We know what x squared is, it's a parabola. We, 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 it's quadratic, we know its graph is a parabola. We might be able to remember what the graph of cosine looks like, <clears throat> right? It's this wave pattern. But it's strange that we've got x in the denominator in there. That does funny things to it. And we'll talk more about that later. All I want to focus on right now is I don't really know what this thing does. And then certainly when I'm multiplying them together, I have a tricky, it's a tricky idea to figure out what this graph might look like. What if I was interested in finding the limit as x goes to zero of k of x? Right. Notice we can't plug zero in. We've got that denominator there with an x in it. And so we'd have a zero in the denominator. So this function is clearly not defined at zero. Um, but can we find the limit? Well, this is an example where we can use the squeeze theorem. Let's recall from trig that we know we know something about cosine of anything, it doesn't matter what I put in here, whatever values I put in here, cosine is always stuck between negative one and one, right? That's just how cosine is defined. It can't do anything but stay between those two values. All right, that's great. Let's do a nice, let's trick, not trick. Um, so now we're going to do some algebra on this inequality. I'm going to multiply the whole thing by x squared. This works out nicely um, because x squared is positive, so I don't have to think about what happens to these inequalities if I'm multiplying by a negative. Um, and so I can just simply multiply each, uh, each of these three pieces of the inequality by x squared. And I get negative x squared is less than or equal to x squared times the cosine of 2 pi over x times x uh, is less than or equal to x squared, okay? So notice what I have now. In our, in our, in our definition uh, of the squeeze or in our statement of the squeeze theorem, this is like my f of x. This is like my h of x. And this is like my g of x, all right? I know I called it something else. I'm just comparing it to our definition over here. So let's think about these three functions. All of these are defined near zero, not at zero, right? We know that that middle one, G, is not defined at zero. The other ones are, but all three of them are defined near zero. It's also true that F of X is less than or equal to G of X, which is less than or equal to H of X near zero. It happens to be true everywhere, but it's definitely true near zero. So we've got most of the statement Let's consider the limits of the functions f and h, this negative x squared and positive x squared. Well, these are straightforward limits to take because we know that for uh, polynomials, we simply evaluate them. And the limit of x squared as x goes to zero is zero. And the limit uh, of negative x squared, uh, Limit as x goes to zero of negative x squared is zero as is the limit of x squared as x goes to zero, right? They both go to zero. And so we now have 
this part from the statement of the theorem that I have in the red box. They both have limits and they're equal. So we get to state, therefore, the limit as x goes to zero of x squared cosine of two pi over x is equal to zero, right? I still don't know much about this function, right? It's, it's still a tricky function, but I can definitely tell you that as we put the values of x closer and closer to zero, the value of this function gets closer and closer to zero, okay? So that's the squeeze theorem. With the squeeze theorem, you were able to show what this limit was, this limit of what I called k of x, uh, without actually having to know much about the function. Um, let's take a second just to think about this function. It's a pretty interesting one. Let's, let's focus on just this part. Let's just think about this. Let's think about what happens as we approach zero from either side. Let, let's just concentrate on one side. Actually, it'd be easier to just think up from one side. So let's think about putting in, uh, if, if x equals uh, one, and then let's get closer to zero at, uh, let's call it one tenth. At x equals one, we get y equals the cosine of two pi over one, which is two pi, which is cosine of two pi is just equal to one. Here, we get y equals cosine of two pi over one tenth, which means we multiply by 10. So we get cosine of 20 pi, which is also equal to one. Let's do one more thing. Let's do one more value. Let's go even closer to zero. X equals one over 100. We get y equals cosine of, now we'll have 200 pi, right? Two pi divided by one one hundredth or multiplied by 100 is 200 pi, which is still one. Each of these represents, right? If we think about our unit circle definition of cosine, let's make a better circle. Whoops, too many, sorry, let's. All right, and might as well use the features of this. Okay, so remember for the cosine definition, we create an angle, the unit circle definition, we create an angle starting with the positive x-axis. When cosine is zero, it's right here. The cosine is the x-coordinate. If we go around one full rotation, that's two pi radians. Right, and that's why we end up back where we started, where cosine equals one. In that time, cosine has gotten smaller, right? As we've rotated around the circle, the x coordinates getting smaller and smaller and smaller, going to negative one, then getting larger and larger and getting back to one. To get to 20 pi, we have to go back around nine more times, right? I'm not gonna draw it nine times, but we keep circling around a total of 10 rotations each of those rotations sees cosine get smaller to negative one, back to one. Sm I'm going backwards. Smaller to negative one, back to one. Smaller to negative one, back to one. So when we start at one, that represented one rotation. When we get to when we go back to one tenth, we're seeing nine more rotations. When we go back to one one hundredth, that two hundred pi now represents hundred rotations. So we've done 10 of them already. There's 90 more rotations that are happening there. So in this tiny interval, so let's see. Uh, let's do it this way. So we start out when x equals one, the output is also one. By the time we get to one tenth, I know it's strange, we're moving backwards but we will have gone through 10 rotations. That means I've got to go down. This is going to be an awful drawing. Down and back up. We're going to do a real graph in a second, 10 times. I'm not even going to try to make 10 perfect graphs because this is ridiculous. Now in this tiny little interval where we go between 1 10th and 1 100th, I've got to go up and down 90 more times. If I go between 1 100th and 1 1000th, cosine is going to spin around 900 more times. So as we're getting closer and closer to zero, 
this thing is just rotating at an increasingly fast rate, right? It's going faster and faster and faster, right? Meanwhile, we're multiplying this whole thing by x squared. So let's take a look at what happens. Let's go to a much better graph than what I have here. Here's the function I was just trying to graph. So I was starting at, at x equals one, where our function value, I don't know why it's jumping around like that, where our function value is one. Let's get rid of some grids, right? And as we go from x equals one to x equals one tenth, somewhere down in here, we can see that wave pattern increasing. And then as we get closer and closer to zero, I'm gonna zoom in for a second, right? That speed at which it's going back and forth is getting ever faster, right? The computer can't track it. It just starts to draw it as solid black lines, right? There's millions and millions and millions and millions. Um, I mean, there's an infinite number of rotations between one and zero. As the X values go between one and zero, there's an infinite number of up and down motions, okay? Really weird um, uh, function, right? As, you, as X gets larger and larger, it's much simpler because what happens? As X gets larger and larger, two pi divided by X gets smaller and smaller. It gets closer and closer to zero. What happens to cosine as you get close to zero, its value gets close to one. And so we see in both directions, the value getting closer and closer to one. So out by infinity, which is a nonsense statement, uh, but as we go away from zero, it gets very simple. But towards zero, it's a very strange function. But that wasn't the function we looked at. The function we looked at was pinned, remember, between x squared and negative x squared. It's multiplied by this. So you're taking all these values as it goes up and down and up and down and up and down, multiplying it by x squared, which is changing those values. So now you're taking something that's between negative one and one and multiplying it by something smaller, you're squeezing down how large it can get. So now let's look at the, the actual function x squared times cosine of two pi over x. And we see the same pattern of, right? You can, if you look closely, you can see it's easiest to look at where it crosses the x-axis. Both of these graphs, let's change their colors. Let's do uh, the one we care about, the one that's part of the squeeze theorem in green. If you look at where these graphs cross, the red and the green graphs cross the x-axis, they're always crossing in the same point. So the rotation is still happening, but the green one's being multiplied by something that's getting smaller and smaller. So it's not able to go its full length up to one and negative one. Let's move this out of the way. Here's the squeeze happening. X squared and negative X squared are, are pinching it in. So it doesn't matter that it has all this crazy behavior going up and down. It, those, pin, those up and down motions are getting pinched in and it gets closer and closer to zero. Even though it's not defined there, the limit, it's still getting closer and closer to it. The function values can be made as close to zero as we want by, look, by getting closer and closer to zero with our X values. Okay, there's a neat, uh, a neat function. It's got pretty fun, fun graph and a good illustration of one of the classic illustrations of the um, squeeze there. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about that. Thanks, everybody. I will see you next time.